Hello friends, welcome to my channel Creating Essence. I am Megan and thank you for stopping by today. Today I wanted to talk to you all a bit more about our autism journey. We got a lot of great questions and comments on our last video on our son's struggle with autism spectrum disorder. I'll put a link below as well as an iCard above if you want to check that out. But a lot of people have asked about the diagnosis process. I have a blog that I used to write in years ago called My Sensational Square Peg. I will put a link to that in the info box below and that talks a lot about the early years. But if you have any questions in particular, I am happy to answer them. Ask away. Today I'm going to specifically talk about the diagnosis process and coming to the very appropriate diagnosis of high functioning autism spectrum disorder. If you've been around here long, you know our son has two diagnoses. He has profound sensory processing disorder as well as high functioning autism spectrum disorder. Our son's journey to uh, these diagnoses came, I'd say straight out the gate. <laughs> uh, we knew something was wrong when he was a newborn throughout his infancy and toddlerhood. And we finally had an evaluation done on him uh, through early intervention when he was just over two years old. At that point, he was mostly nonverbal. He screamed, he cried, he laughed. He had some barely recognizable words, like he'd say, Buh, if he wanted bread, or Tch, if he wanted cheese. That was it. That really was it. He made some clunking noises. As far as um, language formation, that was it. He communicated. He communicated his needs in many ways, but not with words. And there were a lot of other things going on. When we um, scheduled the evaluation for early intervention, um, we were contacted by a services coordinator who set everything up and she was always present for the meetings that would come to our home. For those of you who don't know, in the United States, early intervention is a federal program aimed at helping kids who have um, learning and development struggles early on to get help so that they can succeed by the time they're school age. Um, it is a federal program. Everything is free. Services are free for the parents. So it's not something that's going to cost you. It's not something to be afraid of. They do not diagnose. Early intervention does not put any kind of label on your child. And they are very clear about that. Um, they're simply there to see if a child does have struggles or deficits and then to set up services to help them overcome those. That's it. And we are so grateful for that. When time came for his um, evaluation, we had five professionals at our house. We had a service coordinator, a special education specialist, an occupational therapist, a physical therapist, and a speech therapist. And they all just kind of sat around on our living room floor and played with him and put him through different play-based um, activities. They were all very low pressure, low key, just seeing how he would respond to things or perform things, stuff like that. And then my husband and I had masses of paper to fill out. Um, in addition to regular paperwork, there's what they call a sensory profile because we did know that some of his struggles were sensory related. So it's just a whole bunch of paperwork answering questions about just things you never even considered would be related and they go through that paperwork and compile it in addition to their uh, findings with their uh, activities and things. And even before looking at our sensory profile paperwork, before they left that night, they, you know, confirmed he had significant deficits and would absolutely qualify for speech therapy, but they suspected even more than that. To qualify for services, a child needs to be, um, at least two standard deviations below the norm because kids develop at different rates. And there's the median, like right smack dab in the middle of what they consider the range of normal. And it's kind of split up by percentages. And if it's just one, what's called a standard deviation below that normal range, the kid's probably gonna make it up and it's totally fine. If there are two standard deviations below the norm, 
they could say, yes, this child has deficits and needs some help. If there's three standard deviations below the norm, it's pretty profound. And then you can go above the norm and be much higher than average. For our son, he was two to three standard deviations below the norm in multiple areas, but he also in intelligence was three standard deviations above the norm. Kids will be all over this map, it just <laughs> depends on the child. But uh, he qualified immediately for speech and occupational therapy. We were sent this huge packet uh, it was formal writing on their findings as far as uh, deficits and things like that. And the way that we got a diagnosis was not through early intervention. All they did was provide incredible therapists who came to our house and worked with our son. And they made all the difference in the world. They were amazing. We did occupational therapy, feeding therapy, and speech things two to three days a week for several years. And that's how he began to talk and began to be able to eat more things. And <clears throat> uh, we got a handle on his panic attacks and anxiety and were able to start helping him learn how to cope. And they not only were helpful to our son, it was for the whole family, the therapists, would sit there and show us like okay he's having this reaction and this is why it was this input or it's this and explain the whole process for us which was invaluable because we were able to start to understand our kid and all these struggles he was having they helped explain all these things so that when he would have those reactions or impulses and things when they weren't there we knew what was going on and instead of viewing them as like behavioral or something we knew how to help him and continue with the strategies the therapies the things at home we took that packet of information we received from the evaluation to his pediatrician and she looked it over and consulted a developmental neurologist and we had an appointment with her where she formally uh, after consultation and studying the packet confirmed that he had sensory processing disorder. That was when he was about two and a half years old. So we proceeded for years as if he was just a sensory kid and that's what he needed. We got his sensory issues under control and his anxiety and panic attacks were all very closely linked to his sensory issues. He just, the whole world was really hostile. His auditory processing and visual processing and his tactile and just everything you could imagine. His mouth, his taste, everything was so, so different and the world was super hostile to him in that way. Uh, he did what's called the listening program where it worked on his auditory processing and kind of um, desensitizing him to auditory stimulation things. Uh, we did feeding therapy. We learned that um, his tongue only went forward and backward and uh, most people without realizing it we chew we move the food side to side as we chew. He only went forward and backward which is why he choked all the time which is why he never breastfed well. It was always incredibly painful to breastfeed him from the day he was born until he weaned uh, shortly after he turned one. All of that was because of oral muscular issues related to his neurological processing. That also helped his speech, getting his sensory regulation under control, helped unlock his brain so it could develop speech because it was really clear he was receiving every bit of information we gave him. He just wasn't able to use words and that frustrated him to no end and he would have panic attacks and for a long time we just thought they were tantrums but helping him learn to communicate and getting his sensory regulation under control all helped with that and we were able to help him cope and teach him how to cope and over the years we helped him learn when you feel this way we can do this when you feel this way we can do this and just help him learn how to cope more healthily with the world around him. When he was six, we moved down here to where we are in Virginia. Being in this new environment and having the opportunity to go to a church and try to build community, we started meeting a lot of new people and watching him try to cope socially was so heartbreaking as a mother. And that was one thing. We just 
he was really struggling to make relationships and have a friendships with other kids. He leaned towards the toddlers because they had no expectations of him. He was comfortable playing with toddlers because they could all just play, which was awesome, but he also had a real longing to connect with his peers. And he became very aware of his struggles at that time. We also were dealing with behaviors at home. The best way we can describe it is that he was just, as the sensory issues became under control, as we got them under control and helped him start learning and he started maturing in those things and was able to begin to process those things on his own, they became less of an issue and sort of unearthed the um, other things he struggled with. He just seemed like the most egocentric being you have ever met. It just, everything was just him. We could, he could only see anything from a lens of him. And it wasn't necessarily selfishness. He was a really sweet kid. It was bizarre things. Like when we would, uh, one night we were sitting at the dinner table and the dog wanted to go out. And I said to his sister, Ella, can you go let the dog out? And he leapt up from his seat, grabbed her by the shoulders and threw her out of his way to get to the door to let the dog out. We just, for so long, we treated it as a heart issue, as behavior. Like you cannot treat people this way. Other people matter. And we just struggled so much to try to teach him empathy. And he just seemed like the most self-consumed being you could imagine. After a particularly difficult day and a struggle at dinner, just kind of a light bulb went on, my, went on in my head. I can only describe it as a voice I heard in my head that said, this is not behavioral. I started doing some digging. I kind of had a feeling. And I started digging into what was called then Asperger's, which now, um, everything, it's an autism spectrum. What used to be Asperger's as considered a different thing is just higher functioning on the autism spectrum, but it's all the same neurological processing. So I started to research and I have a friend in Texas who has two teens who uh, both were diagnosed with Asperger's around the time they were between eight and 10 years old. Talked to her, I said, look, I kind of got this feeling here's what we're seeing. Tell me if you think I'm totally off base with this. And she was like, that is totally spot on. We were just kind of thinking. That fall, he came to a very dark place. He dealt with what I can only describe as really deep depression. He felt like he could do nothing right and he must be the most horrible thing. He just so hated himself and everything about himself. And he just, he became acutely aware of his struggles and his differences and how most of the time they sort of caused him to treat other people badly. And he said over and over how he just needed to die. God needed to kill him. Why did God create such a horrible creature as him? Um, because he just can't do anything right and he can't treat people right and he just tortures everyone around him and he doesn't know how to stop and how he just needed to die. And at that point we were like, okay, this isn't something we can really just mull over in our heads anymore. This is really something that we need. He needs help. He needs help. It's not something that we can just kind of accept as being part of him. It, he needs help. So we took him to a fantastic program here and they did a pre-evaluation sort of appointment and just kind of went through some vague ropes and things with him, with us present. We all just sat in the room with a, a developmental neuropsychologist and she, at the end of the meeting, she said, um, yes, I think it is very valid to consider continuing 
with the evaluation process for autism. So uh, we did. It was five hours over the course of three days. Uh, all of it with us present. Sometimes my husband went, sometimes it was both of us. We filled out sensory profiles again of his like his current state of things and it was just so exhaustive. Kind of like setting up scenarios that he wasn't really aware was any kind of setup. He just thought they were like talking and playing and stuff like that to see how he would respond and try to talk through things with him to see what his sort of knee-jerk reaction to that was. And just, I mean, five hours of that sort of thing. At the end of those three days, we had another meeting with a doctor and she confirmed that he still, the sensory processing disorder, despite his excellent uh, coping skills and management of that, it still was profound enough that it was its own its own issue because all individuals with autism have sensory issues it's just kind of one of those things but his are profound and life affecting enough that they are their own issue and their own valid diagnosis he also very clearly has high functioning autism spectrum disorder people have asked why get a diagnosis uh, what can it do? Why label my child? What I always say is a label only has the power you give it. Um, your child being appropriately diagnosed with anything like sensory processing disorder or autism spectrum disorder that has the ability to cripple or empower and you give it that direction. You give it that power. Are you going to use it as a crutch? Are you going to teach your child that it's an excuse or a crutch or use it as an excuse to other people to excuse any kind of behavior or as some kind of crutch? Or are you going to use it appropriately? For us, it meant um, insurance covering the services he needed, the group therapy, the peer therapy groups with other kids on the high functioning autism spectrum so that they don't feel alone. So they realize there are other people like them. And it means insurance will cover those therapies and services and things that he needs to do well. And it also helps us, even without spending a dime, it helps us to understand our child because we can do more research, we can get in touch with communities of people and connect in ways and help each other cope because we've been able to give this struggle a name and now we can all come together in a community under that name and help each other with experience. How did you find this video? Unless you're a subscriber of mine, a search brought you here with either the sensory processing disorder or the autism labels. My son is not inhibited by either of his diagnoses. They have provided him with literal life-saving services that have empowered us to help our son thrive. They are not something that will follow him his whole life. He doesn't have to tell anybody if he, that he has autism or SPD. So a diagnosis has the power that you give it. You can use it to get help and resources in many different ways or you can use it as a crutch. That is why we pursued diagnoses in these areas. If you have any questions, please put them in the info box below. I am happy to answer them. I'm happy to do additional videos on specific things that if you would like to see them, just let me know. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up, share it if you think it might help someone, and subscribe to our channel for more videos like this. Bye friends.